Cory Booker is now saying, you guys are all racist because no black people are on the stage. And then what are the white people saying? They're saying, well, wait a minute. It was a free, it's a free poll and fundraising is free. And if you really like Kamala Harris and Cory Booker, they should, black people and white people should, should vote for them and get higher in the polls. Our, our, our only crime is we're beating them. And then we watching this said, no, 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 you're guilty under your own ideologies of disparate impact. Because according to your own philosophy, if the proportions of a particular profession are not reflective of the actual numbers in the population. And even if racism doesn't exist, it does exist. It's implicit. Therefore, there are six people on that stage, they're all white. Somebody is racist. Why do we know that? Because you told us that. And that's what happens in these revolutionary movements. Yesterday's revolutionary is today's counter-revolutionary and tomorrow's enemy of the people and they get into that Jacobin phase, and that's what happened to the Democratic Party. Now nobody can be pure enough, and what happened, they're all white, elite, wealthy people on this stage, and they stand convicted by the hypocrisies of their own ideologies that they impose on all the rest of us. And we get to watch it. It's theater to see this in action. In the eyes of classicist Victor Davis Hanson, how does the current impeachment inquiry against President Donald Trump evoke classical Greek tragedy, notably the concepts of hubris and nemesis? Why is the DOJ Inspector General Horowitz report on FISA abuse unlikely to satisfy those seeking more accountability for the Spygate scandal? What is the deep state really? And how is Trump dismantling the quote, progressive project? And how does this explain the anti-Trump resistance? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleck. In this episode, we'll sit down again with historian and political commentator Victor Davis Hanson, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Case for Trump. Victor Davis Hanson, excellent to have you back on American Thought Leaders. Thank you for having me. So, you know, in April when we spoke last time, I think it was actually on the day that the Mueller report was coming out. Yes. And, and we were talking a little bit about expectations. As it happens today, the IG report, the Horowitz report on FISA abuse yes. uh, is, is coming out. So I think we have to start by basically doing the same thing. Um, there's been pretty wildly different accounts based on leaks mostly and just some theories people have on what will be in there. What are your expectations? Uh, they're pretty much the same as his report on the email uh, investigation of Hillary and the leaks by FBI officials in which he had two criminal referrals, I think three against Andrew McCabe and even one against James Comey. And so I think in some sense if you believe that he's going to have 10 or 12 criminal referrals, these are just suggestions that a prosecutor should take up that information for a formal indictment right. of Clapper or, or anybody like Brennan or McComb. I don't think that's going to happen. And it's narrowed to the FISA and, and it's in the news constantly how narrow his range of investigatory powers and authority is. He can't go overseas, he can only interview people who are currently working uh, at the DOJ. But that being said, I think we're going to learn that the FISA uh, warrant process is, was abused and that people who signed those warrants are going to be shown that they didn't reveal all the information they, they knew about. In one case, there were probably altered documents and uh, there may be some criminal referrals, but uh, I think we're suffering from increased expectations, and by that I mean if you came from Mars three years ago and you said the entire DC hierarchy would be now fired, reassigned, retired, or voluntarily um, quit, and by that I mean James Baker, Rebecca, Lisa Page, Peter Strzok, Andrew McCabe, James Comey, etc. Nobody would have believed it, but we're so inured now to scandal that our expectations have to keep going higher and higher, that we have to get a big scalp or there's, there was no wrongdoing. So I think it's going to be between those two extremes. Um, 
a big question on my mind, and I, I think I tweeted about this this morning, is yeah. just simply will, you know, will the Nunes memo findings be reflected? Yeah. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you think that will be the case? I think the Nunes memo, by now, everybody agrees with the content of it, essentially that Hillary Clinton paid through three firewalls for opposition research to damage the campaign of Donald Trump. And by three, I mean there were Russian sources, there was GPS, there were Perkins Coie, and there was a DNC. I and mean, if you take that onion and you undo the layers as Nunes did, it was something that we still can't grasp. You mean a sitting Democratic administration under Barack Obama, the people who worked at the highest levels of the intelligence and investigatory agencies essentially and hand in glove worked with Hillary Clinton to release information to damage uh, her opponent. And when you get that part of the memo, then everything in the process of projection makes sense. And by that I mean everybody thought Hillary would win the election. So they took extra risk and exposures they otherwise wouldn't have. I'm talking now about Nellie Orr and Bruce Orr and Comey and Clapper and Brennan because they thought that that behavior would be rewarded by President Hillary Clinton. They would go in and say, we knew you were going to win, but we just wanted to make sure that everybody knew who Trump really was. And then in their wildest imagination of what wouldn't happen did happen. And then they were scrambling and then we got Russian collusion and uh, obstruction in Ukraine. A lot of that is sort of a project, a psychological projection, preemption if you will, to cover their own culpability. And that's going to take a long time to peel that back and see what the actual wrongdoing is. So you're that's interesting. You're not expecting a whole whack of criminal referrals, uh, which a, f a lot of people would certainly yes. like to see from what we're seeing. And of course, um, but you are expecting there will be accountability. Well, the reason is, remember, there's about six things going on. There were informants and there was the unmasking and leaking of names. And then there was uh, email, but we're just talking about the FISA abuse, mostly. And in that, we're really talking about the people who signed the FISA writs on the part of the government, Sally Yates, James Comey, Andrew McCabe, and the people who prepared the material for them. And we, I think there's going to be no question that the material that was submitted to the FISA court was either incomplete, knowingly incomplete, or knowingly fraudulent and misleading. And then the question is, I think a James Comey or an Andrew McCabe or a Sally Yates or a Rod Rosenstein is going to say, we do this so often and we get all of this material. I had no idea that this subordinate altered an email. I had no idea that this subordinate didn't tell me that Hillary Clinton paid for this. And I think that's going to be very hard to prove given that they no longer work for these agencies. They're out of office, so the IG can't go out to Denver, Colorado, or London and, and okay. investigate it. Interesting. You know, there's uh, this uh, tweet came out sort of, you know, as we were talking a little bit earlier um, from Shimon Prokupic. Uh, he said, this is going to be interesting today. Christopher Steele was told yesterday that information on him he has not reviewed and was expected to be redacted was declassified and will now be included in the IG report. Yes. What, what, what do you make of this kind of thing? I think you know? people, uh, remember the official position of the impeachment committees and Adam Schiff's intelligence committee is that Christopher Steele's material is still viable. It's still uh, accurate. And nobody, I think, in the American intelligence community or the British intelligence community believes that anymore. And almost every fact that he said, whether it's about Michael Cohen's father-in-law or where Michael Cohen was or a, a Russian uh, consulate in Miami, is false. Even the, the most mundane facts. And so what we're seeing now are efforts to distance themselves from Christopher Steele. And I think when you're done with the whole process of the IG report and what Durham is going to give us in a few months, you'll see that he was basically a disgraced, retired British intelligence officer who wanted to make a quick buck 
and dreamed up this memo. And if you read it, it's got this sort of James Bond format to it, capital letters, and it has all of the, the lingo, but you read it and it, it's absolutely insane. I mean, the idea that Carter Page is going to go over to Russia and come back with maybe a billion dollars in commissions, and he has no really influence in Russia. And so it, it's, and the idea that we would trust or give currency to this document because it, supposedly confirmed our pre-existing prejudices against Trump. So I think what we're going to see now is a gradual distancing from Christopher Steele and people on the left saying, we had no idea that he, he was doing this. And just because he did it didn't mean that all the evidence elsewhere is suspect. But the fact that Christopher Steele was a bad actor doesn't have anything to do with the idea that Trump did things that were nefarious. I think that's what we're going to see. So I've had on my mind lately has been this idea of the of the deep state. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, you know obviously very connected with everything we've just been been talking about. And uh, you know again we've had various reports on this. There's people that are saying deep deep state is this conspiracy theory. What are you talking about? There's other people that are happy there a deep state exists and and you know is presumably protecting Americans. Um, and there's some people who even identify, identify themselves as being members of it. Yeah, um, <laughs> ex-CIA, John McLaughlin, the interim right. director, and John Brennan both praised it. Thank God for the deep state. So what, for, I mean, what does deep state really even mean, yeah. I guess is the first question, and does it, does it exist? Yeah, it does exist, and it's, the classic definition is a state within a state. By that, they mean that the permanent bureaucracies at the highest levels that have the levers of power, the ability to do damage to you or me, the IRS, the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, some of the top cabinet officials, they are people who transcend elections. They're not elected. Or if they are, uh, they participate in an administration, they revolve back and forth. They go back to the state, from the State Department to the Council on Foreign Relations to the Treasury Department to a high office in the CIA. But the point about it all is they have a particular loyalty as if they're an organic entity, a bacillus, a vira, vira that they're, they're organic, they exist. And they feel that when an administration comes in, they step up. As Lieutenant Colonel Vindman said, Trump was not going by our talking points. He was not talking, and they never say to themselves, I'm not elected. The Constitution says an elected president sets foreign policy, period. So there's a sense that they, as credentialed experts, they have a value system. And the value system is they have an inordinate respect for an Ivy League degree or a particular alphabetic combination after their name, a JD, a PhD, an MBA or a particular resume. I, I worked at the NSC, then I transferred over to the, N, the NSA, and then I went into the State Department. And we saw that in really vivid examples during the Adam Schiff uh, impeachment inquiries where a series of State Department people, before they could even talk, said, I'm the third generation to serve in my family. I, I had, this is my resume, this is where I went to school, this is where I was posted. And in the case of Adam Schiff, we saw these law professors who had gone in and out of government, and they had these academic billets. And to condense all that, it could be distilled by saying, the deep state makes arguments by authority. I'm an authority, and I have credentials, and therefore ipsy dixit. What I say matters and they don't want to be cross-examined, they don't want to have their argument in the arena of ideas and cross-examination, they think it deserves authority, and they have contempt, and I mean that literally, contempt for elected officials. These are buffoons in private enterprise, they are CEO in some company, they're some local Rotary Club member, they get elected to Congress, and then we have to school them on the international order or the rules-based order. They have a certain lingo or uh, proper sober and judicious comportment. So you can imagine that Donald Trump and Raji, to take a metaphor, Rodney Dangerfield out of Caddyshack comes in as this, what they would say, stereotype 
a buffoon and starts screaming and yelling and he looks different, he talks different, and he has no respect for these people at all. Maybe that's a little extreme that he doesn't, but he, he surely doesn't. And that frightens them and then they coalesce. And I'm being literal now. Remember the anonymous uh, September 5th, 2018 op-ed writer who right. said, I'm here actively trying to oppose Donald Trump. And he, act, he actually said that uh, he wanted him to leave office. And then Admiral McRaven said, the sooner the better. This is a four-star admiral, retired, says a year before the election, this, we want to get, Trump should leave, the sooner the better. That's a pretty frightening idea. And uh, when you have Mark Zaid, the lawyer for the uh, whistleblower, and also the lawyer uh, for some of the other people involved in this, uh, I think it's, it's conspiracy, saying that we're coup, one coup leads to another, and viva, and the, as Mr. Klein Smith said, the FBI, the person who altered the document on the FISA request, viva, I think he used the, the um, masculine rather than the feminine article, viva la resistance it should be. Right. and people are talking about a coup, then we have to take them at their own word. You know, in, in the last time we were speaking, we were talking about, uh, you know, the Mueller investigation. I think you said that the kind of greatest irony uh, uh, is that Trump was falsely accused uh, by people who were actually colluding, yes. right? And this, and this, and so, and then you also said, and this is actually, I'll, uh, I, I have this in my notes, you said that by pursuing largely innocent people, uh, the Mueller investigation or the special counsel team basically provided a model for the people who are actually guilty of collusion yeah, to be did. prosecuted. It did. Right. And that we, were, we saw that specifically with Michael, General Flynn, who was uh, picked up supposedly on an excerpt, a surveillance excerpt targeting the Russian ambassador, but it was actually reverse targeting him. And then he was interviewed by uh, Peter Strzok, who felt that he was voracious. And then that notes of that interview were altered by none other than Lisa Page, and then that was transmogrified into an indictment of him. And then uh, that was sort of a projection because they had a lot of culpability. And what was that culpability? It was people like Samantha Power requesting 260 names to be leaked. It was James Comey going right outside a confidential presidential conversation, writing on a, a memo on an FBI um, machine, and then later using that as insurance and leaking it, and then subject to criminal exposure, except post facto, somebody in the FBI decided, well, we have to classify those memos, whether they were just you know, confidential or secret. If they're secret, he, he committed a felony. But who were those people who post facto adjudicated the classification, Lisa Page and Peter Strzok and a couple of others. So it, it was pretty damning, I think. And the same thing as we're seeing in the Ukraine, it's the same modus operandi. Joe Biden brags to everybody in a moment, the for, of all places, the Council on Foreign Relations, right. that he's gone over there and said, six hours, I'm gonna cut a billion dollars in aid. Now we're not talking about lethal aid because it didn't exist. The Obama administration would not give javelin missiles. They would not help Ukraine in its hour of need. That's very important to remember that because that's the accusation against Trump. Thinking about cutting lethal aid, which had been given in their hour of need as a felony or impeachable offense, but never even giving it is okay. But what he said is, I'm going to cut non-lethal aid, which would be humanitarian aid, all aid, everything, unless you fire Mr. Slocum. And uh, now the fired prosecutor has gone to an Austrian court and now he's giving more uh, filmed interviews in which he says, I was investigating Hunter Biden and I was gonna cut off all resources for Burisma and Joe, Joe Biden knew that and was sent over to get me fired. I don't know if that's voracious or not, but that's a quid pro quo and instead of investigating that, we have this strange doctrine that because Joe Biden is now running for president, that provides him with legal immunity from even discussing what he did as a vice president. We flipped it all around. We're saying because he's a candidate, Donald Trump tried to 
quid pro quo U.S. security interests for his own personal campaign. Donald Trump's not the nominee of the Republican Party. Joe Biden is not the nominee of the Democratic Party in 2020. We don't know what the race is going to be like. But the idea that we have to give him an exemption from suspect behavior because now, two years later, three years later, he's running for president is absurd. And again, it's part of this projection mentality that the best offense, the best defense is an offense. Well, you, so you had said, and this is what really kind of struck or stuck with me was that, you know, given this historical perspective you have uh, uh, on, on these sorts of scenarios, this is what hubris and nemesis yeah. is all about. And I was thinking, since we were, you know, kind of using that lens of the Sophoclean tragedy to look at, you know, the Mueller investigation, I was wondering if you could take that same lens and put it onto impeachment. You've already started, yeah. you've already started doing that. But, yeah. um, well, I mean, Joe Biden didn't have to do any of that. He didn't have to tell us at the Council on Foreign Relations <laughs> that he had basically squashed an independent Ukrainian investigation by threatening to hold aid. But his ego and his self, sense of self-importance and his desire to run for president in the future thought that this would be another uh, corn pop or all of these moments he has where he brags about his masculinity and his toughness. Okay, but the way Nemesis works is that creates this narrative so that when people accuse Donald Trump of that, they say, well, we're basically looking at Donald Trump's thought crime that he considered cutting aid that he gave that Obama did not give lethal aid. And he delayed it, he thought about it. And then he maybe, at the worst, he thought about talking about an investigator who was never relieved. But here's Joe Biden who really did do that. And he's bragging about it because he's arrogant and nemesis uh, is starting to take its toll. And the same thing was true of the Mueller investigation. Remember, they said, well, he obstructed justice. We think, we sort of believe he kind of did, but it's not actionable because he thought about it almost in uh, Murder in the Cathedral uh, style. Who will relieve me of Mueller? You know, he didn't say go fire Mueller. And of course, he had the, the ability to do so under the Constitution, but he didn't. He didn't do what Richard Nixon did and fire Archibald Cox, but it was a, the idea that he thought about it the idea that he thought about certain things with Ukraine when we have other examples of people actually did that. And that's where nemesis, because they're so emboldened. And a good example of hubris and nemesis is Adam Schiff. So Adam Schiff gets away with leaking these lies throughout the Mueller investigation. I know what's going on. It's a bombshell. You can't believe it. Everyone is wrong. And then he says, my staff is, I or my staff have never met with a whistleblower. We know that was a lie. It's a demonstrable lie. Then he says he reads a caricature of the actual transcript of the phone call with Trump and the Ukrainian president. And he, it's completely, you know, fantastic. It's not, it's not factual. Then when he's caught, he said, oh, that was just a parody. So he's, he's becoming hubristic at, to a point where the ultimate nemesis is waiting for him at the opportune moment. And the opportune moment was, next thing we know, he's so emboldened that he starts, for the first time in the history of the U.S. Congress, starting to surveil the metadata of phone calls of his own ranking minority member, Devin Nunes, of the president's own lawyer and other people. And then he not only does this stealthily, but he's so arrogant, he puts it in his report because he thinks he can get away with it. And I think Nemesis is going to catch him, and, but it's going to, you know, the wheels of the gods grind slowly, <laughs> but they do grind finely, so I think finally we're going to learn. So I get the sense that you don't think that the president is being treated very fairly in these uh, impeachment proceedings. No, I think that people feel that for a variety of reasons, cultural, social, political, that Trump is not deserving of the respect that most presidents uh, uh, receive, and therefore any means necessary to get rid of him are justified. And for some, it's the idea that he's had, ne he's had neither political or, or uh, military prior experience. For others, it's his outlandish appearance, his Queen's accent, as I said, his Rodney Dangerfield 
uh, presence, and for others it's, he's, and I think this is really underestimated, he is systematically undoing the progressive agenda of Barack Obama, which, remember, was supposed to be not just a eight-year regnum, but 16 years with Hillary Clinton. That would have reformed the court, it would have shut down fossil fuel exploration, pipelines, uh, more regulations, what, pretty much what Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are talking about right now. That was going to happen. And so for a lot of people, they think, wow, if Donald Trump is elected in 2020, and he will be according to the fears of Representative Al Green or Ocasio-Cortez or Nancy Pelosi, Remember, they keep saying this, this impeachment's about the 2020. We've got to ensure the integrity. That's what Nadler, Nadler said today. But if Trump is elected, that would mean eventually in five more years, seven to two Supreme Court, 75% of the federal judiciary, conservative and traditionalist and constructionist, uh, world's largest, we are the world's largest oil and gas producer and yes. exporter, but we probably would be even bigger. And when you look at a lot of issues such as abortion or identity politics or the securing of the border or uh, the nature of the economy or foreign policy. They think America as we know it will be fundamentally, to use a phrase from Barack Obama, fundamentally transformed. So that's the subtext of it. Stop this man right now before he destroys the whole progressive project and with it the reputation of the media, because the media s saw this happening and they said, you know what, as Jim Rutenberg of the New York Times or Christiane Amanpour have said, in extremists you really don't need to be disinterested. Trump is beyond the pale, so it's okay to editorialize in your news coverage. And so the Shorenstein Center has reported that 90% of all news coverage is negative. So they've thrown their hat in the ring and said, we're going to be part of the democratic progressive agenda to destroy this president, but if they fail, then their reputation goes down with the progressive uh, project, and that's happening now. CNN is at all-time low ratings, at least the last four years, and the network news is losing audiences, and uh, most of the major newspapers are as well, so there's a lot of high stakes here, and uh, if Donald Trump survives and were to be reelected, I don't know what would happen on the left. It would be, it would make the 2016 reaction look tame in comparison. There's a couple of things that you just talked about that are you know, deeply interesting to me. One of them is you know, the progressive project. Yeah. Let's see that in quote. Can you, can you outline yeah. in a broader sense what that is? I think that's very important. Yes, I do too, because I want to be clear about what I meant and not just throw out terms. So the progressive project started in the 19th century and it took hold with Woodrow Wilson in the early 20s. And its basic belief was that the U.S. Constitution erred on the side of liberty rather than equality. We should have been like the French Revolution, more of a fluid concept that would change with the times and use the power of government not to ensure a quality of opportunity but to mandate a quality of result. And therefore, there were certain things in the Constitution that prevented that project. And we've changed a lot of them. We've now had senators elected by direct vote and not appointed by the legislatures. The states cannot have property qualifications. Some of these were justified as archaic in the 18th century sense. But given those reforms, we're still not to where we want to be. And what do I mean by that? The Supreme Court can be an obstacle. And so we need to pack the court. We need, and now Democratic candidates no longer see the 1937 FDR effort to pack the court as disreputable, but an honorable attempt. So they're all endorsing, let's pack the court and make 15 judges if we can't get our guys on the court. Let's abolish the Electoral College and all the arguments that these people with powdered wigs in the 18th century came up with. Let's just have a direct vote and let California and New York and the Great Lakes, uh, big cities, Chicago, determine the election. And why do you have to go out in a place like Wyoming or, or Utah? And let's get rid of this archaic idea of two senators from Utah 
or from Wyoming having as much clout as two senators from California. And here we're speaking in California, my senator represents 20 million people. A senator in Wyoming rec represents 250,000. One man might vote, let's get rid of it, even though it's in the Constitution. What am I getting at is they want to streamline the Constitution continually in an effort to make a country of radical equality. And that requires certain things like this impeachment or uh, to prune the Second Amendment or to say that the First Amendment does not apply here at Stanford University because we can say that's hate speech what he said. He has no right to say hate speech. I declare that hate speech, therefore don't speak. And so the First Amendment, the Second Amendment are being pruned, the due process on college campuses. If somebody, if I say that I was sexually assaulted by that person over there and I, I don't have to I don't have to come forward to identify myself. That person is not given constitutional rights under the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment as he would in a criminal trial off campus. The ACLU, the used to be the champion of uh, free speech, is now a grassroots organizer, it says, political organizer. You don't see any ACL, ACLU outrage at Adam Schiff is now going into the phone records of members of Congress even though when the U.S. government looked in the phone records of terrorists in 2001 after 9-11, the ACLU said that was a violation of residence rights, not U.S. citizens, but residents. And so what I'm getting at is that the Progressive Project is a multifaceted effort by uh, intellectuals, academics, foundations, uh, the progressive members of the Democratic Party to change formally the Constitution and to change the mindset of the American people so that we can make people all the same uh, by the powers of government. And we see what's going on. We've seen it in Cuba, we've seen it in Russia, we've seen it in Venezuela, we've seen it in China, and we've seen a soft, benign form in Europe. And the United States is really the only major country in the world that says, you know what, that process inevitably leads to an Orwellian totalitarian state and it crushes liberty and individual freedom and we're not going to do it here and that's why we have a Bill of Rights and a Constitution. So, you know, the countries that you mentioned are all, you know, communist, uh, of course, aside from the soft, benign uh, version that you described. So this is, this is cultural Marxism taking form or actual Marxism taking form yes. or um, how, how do you see that? Well, when Angela Merkel says that she's going to restrict rights of free speech in Germany because of hate speech. I was astounded by this. Yes, I was too. Like, That's not all that much different than what people are saying in China about Hong Kong. That the people who are protesting in it for their freedom and liberty and to honor the accords that were established when Hong Kong was freed from British control don't really matter anymore. It's the same idea that the state it has superior wisdom and can adjudicate to individuals how they should think, how they should behave, and how they should reflect the agendas of the state. And the only difference is that uh, when people object in Germany, they're not shot as they are in Hong Kong. At least not yet. But what worries me about the EU, the soft despotism is that whether it's matters of immigration with Eastern Europe or matters of financial control with Greece and Italy and Spain or matters of Brexit with Britain or matters of NATO obligations with us, the, the position of Germany and the position of France and the position of the Northern European countries is we don't really trust grassroots people we don't trust these Southern Europeans, these Eastern Europeans, these crazy, crazy Anglo-Americans. We have superior knowledge, we have the power of the EU state, and we're going to, from a top-down fashion, tell you what to think. This is a banana, because it's five inches long. That's not a banana. Whatever you think, that's not a banana. Or this beach has six, uh, six pieces of trash every four cubic, or every square meters, therefore it's not an EU beach. It's the idea that the all-knowing panopticon octopus can go into every local uh, landscape and adjudicate what people are going to think and do. Sometimes it's good. 
but most of the time it's scary. You know, the, what strikes me right now is that with the advent, even perhaps even in just the last 10 years of new technologies, um, those technologies enable a level of enacting of the system that you're describing that you know just were unimaginable before. And we see that happening in places like Xinjiang and China. Um, we see that you know a lot of com companies are developing this. Um, the question I've been asking myself is, um, with these technologies existing, is it you know isn't it almost inevitable that they're going to be used in this way? Yes. What's worried, worrisome about it, again, all of these developments in this age of high tech seem to substantiate the singular genius of George Orwell. He's thinking far beyond his own landscape when he said that technology was going to be married with authoritarianism to monitor your daily activity. So what China is doing is the ultimate expression of Silicon Valley. They would like to do it. They do it with marketing. And I, I'll give you an example of what I meant. Uh, Yesterday, I went on to Amazon and ordered a back brace to work on my farm. Today, all of these ads are popping up about back pills, back creams, everything from different companies. So they have mined that and they're doing that. But China has taken that to the political level. So there's two issues here. One is intrusiveness and one is alteration of reality. China is intruding into not just people's behaviors, but their thoughts. What did you say to a friend on the phone? What did you imagine? Where did you go to shop? Did you, uh, as you were riding your bike, did you look at a Wager re-education camp? Could we see you looking in a particular, so it's a thought crime. Sort of analogous to Donald Trump being guilty of thinking about suspending aid or thinking about f uh, firing Robert Mueller. But then now they have the technology to monitor your facial recognition. So when somebody in a conversation talked about the premier of China, did you have a scowl on your face? If so, did that reflect uh, counter-revolutionary sentiment? The other thing that's scary is the alteration of, of reality with these sophisticated technology. I'll give you an example of a high-profile case that was scary, was George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. Yes. So George Zimmerman is beaten to a pulp, and yet when we see his picture on CNN, it's been photoshopped to downplay the severity of his wounds. He gave a 9-11 talk uh, right in real time when he saw Trayvon Martin. If you read the entire transcript, he did not single him out because he was black. That became an answer to a question. When you saw the CNN tape, they edited it in such a way that he was a raving racist on, his, on the lookout for black people. And then the New York Times created new vocabulary. They called him a white Hispanic. He was half Peruvian. According to the rules of identity politics, if you're not completely white, then you're a minority. So George Zimmerman's mother was named Mesa from, from Peru. What if he had Hispanicized his name? He could have been Jorge Mesa. Jorge Mesa and Trayvon Martin is a non-story. But if he's recalibrated into a white person using his father's Germanic name, you almost have George Zimmerman as almost if he's this Germanic white racist. And so the New York Times has a dilemma because they know he's Hispanic. According to their own rules, he has to be Hispanic. So they call him, they make up a new term, white Hispanic. And that alteration of reality, both linguistic and technological, is very scary. And we saw it with CNN in the reporting of the Trump so-called collusion where uh, James Comey is just about to give a statement in which he said he didn't, he told, he didn't say that Trump was not under investigation, was completely false. Donald Trump knew about a Trump Tower. And then on the technological side, there was a ping and a machine in the Trump Tower that was telling everybody, communicating with the Alpha Bank in Russia, the use of this technology in a very perverted way. And so that's what I'm scared about is that uh, you can be so intrusive that you can convict people for thinking things and then you can use these technologies to, to alter visual imagery, Photoshop, change, edit text, uh, voice synthesization to make up things.
and both of those are occurring right now. The only thing that saves us from being like China or the EU is the U.S. Constitution. So I take very seriously when people say the founders really didn't mean what you think they said with the First Amendment. They really didn't mean what they said with the Second Amendment. They really didn't mean when we amended the, 20, the presidential succession, the 25th Amendment really didn't mean what it says. It means if you think this president's a little weird, then you can get a group of people and try to remove him, like McCabe and Rosenstein discuss. So that, that's what's scary, because that's the only thing saving us, is what the founders, that's why they created it, and they were far brighter than we were, Hamilton and Madison and Jefferson. And they knew all of these problems because they were so much better read from Greece and Rome and the Enlightenment. And they, they really fought, and as the Federalist Papers show, they really fought with each other and they tried to show this system would be superior to other similar systems in Europe, and it has been. But it does have one, one weakness, it has one vulnerability. If you're on the left, you see it as an impediment to this uh, anointed group of overseers crafting a equality result, socialist equality, egalitarian utopia. So they, when they, they look at the American Revolution, it says, give me liberty or give me death, and they don't see the word fraternity in there or egalitarianism like the French Revolution. That's our fatal flaw. And they, they're hell-bent on, on rectifying it. You mentioned identity politics, which is kind of central to the progressive project, right? And I, it's a I can't help but think about identity politics as being, as, let's say, especially as it applied to race, as being fundamentally racist, yeah. right? And this is, I, I find it difficult to understand how one could use this system and, and say, no, actually, it's the people who don't subscribe to it who are racist. How does this work? Well, identity, to define our terms, identity politics refers to the idea that your superficial appearance, gender or race, is essential, not incidental to who you are. And that should be the touchstone of all of your ideological thinking and your political uh, affiliations. And the reason that people believe this is that they understand that most people, by the time they get to be 30 to 40 to 50, have certain traditional and conservative experiences. They get married, they have children, they buy a home, they pay taxes, they buy a car, and those experiences tend to make them more traditional and more conservative. And they follow certain tenets of human nature. They understand human nature pretty well by the time you're 40, what people are capable of. And that is not uh, synonymous or even helpful to the progressive project. And so they say to themselves, how can we alter that? Well, if there's an economic collapse, obviously in the Great Depression we had the New Deal, or uh, we saw what happened after World War I in the Soviet Union. But barring a natural catastrophe, uh, they have to, to do certain things. And one of them is they have to change the demographic. And by changing the demographic, they can do it in two ways. One is they take the existing demographic and they look at the melting pot and they say intermarriage, assimilation, integration, then we're all becoming just people and then we're all subject to political ideas that are irrespective of where we came from or how we look and that's not good. So they're actually taking the 1 16th drop of the old confederacy and saying if you are 1 8th Chinese, if you are 1 4th Native American, if you're 1 16th black, then that defines who you are. And they do it to such an extent now that, as I said with George Zimmerman, you can't tell, because we're an intermarried society, we can't tell who's who. And the reason that Elizabeth Warren got away with it, saying that she was Native American when she had no Native American blood, essentially, and she didn't look anywhere near like the so-called stereotype Native American was that we were in a mindset that you are, you can construct your identity as you construct your gender and there are career advantages to doing so. Okay, that's one way we do it. And the other is that we actually not just alter the ideologies of people within the United States and make them think in racial terms, gender terms, 
uh, religious affiliation terms, but we import people. So we have right now 60, 50 million to 60 million people, we don't know the exact number, who were not born in the United States. In the state of California in which we're speaking, 27% of the population, it's an all-time high, were not born in the United States. We have about, according to the Yale MIT study, 15 to 20 million people living here illegally from south of the border. And the message to all of those people is, you are a new wave of immigration. You're not European, you're not wealthy, you don't have degrees, you didn't come with skills, and so you're a victim of a white establishment, a capitalist system, and the only way you can make it in America is start identifying with the black caucus, the Latino caucus, the Asian caucus, the gay caucus, the transgendered community, and we're gonna bundle all of you together and form a 51% along with the people who are here who have been woke, and we're gonna have a majority, and the majority will then have a, a paternalistic state that will dish out uh, entitlements to you in exchange for your fealty. And once you set this system up, very predictable things follow. Who would you hate the most of all? You would hate somebody who is African American who doesn't identify as African American. So you would hate a Tom Soul, or my colleague Shelby Steele. Or if you were Muslim, you would hate Ayan Hirsi Ali, who says Islam is incidental. The fact I'm women, I'm female and black is incidental to who I am or you would look at the Hong Kong protesters or, and they're saying, it doesn't really matter that I'm Chinese or not Chinese, I believe in particular freedoms. The United States is more of a free country than my ethnic affiliated China. And those are, you, we look in the Latino community where I live, and when I see people in their 50s who voted for Donald Trump or who did not vote for Hillary Clinton, they're considered sellouts because what they have done is they've transcended their superficial appearance and their background. And that's what the project, this term projective uh, identity politics despise because those people are subversive because they say, you know what, the United States is the first multiracial society that's worked in the history of, of, of civilization that it really doesn't matter what you look at look like as an American. You can look like anything, but you have to have certain views. You have to live in a physical space. You have to have borders. You have to have honor for the tradition. Shakespeare is just as much yours as it is some sixth generation white person. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address uh, is as much a Polish immigrant or a Taiwanese immigrant as it is a white person. That is a very subversive idea, and that's why the left despises it. Victor, I'll tell you why all this is on my mind. Um, you know, I, I, you had a column some weeks ago about, you know, essentially Trump hate. Um, uh, and you made this obs observation about uh, Trump dismantling the, the progressive project that we, that we discussed, um, which I thought you put in a way, I, I had been thinking something along those lines, but you put it, you put it a lot better than, than I could have. Um, and I, I, you know, passed on this information. A friend of mine reached out to me after that, and he said, he told me, you know, you're part of the cult of Trump, so to speak. I, I remember seeing something about a psychologist talking on CNN about how, you know, the, the people that aren't ag against Trump are sort of cultists or something like this. And, and by the way, this is a person who's, you know, who's a thoughtful person who I respect. You know, and uh, and and you know, he said, you know, maybe one day you'll come back to seeing to seeing sanity and so forth. And it struck me, you know, I'm I'm not sure if I don't necessarily think he subscribes to the progressive pro project, but I think he does believe what he sees in the media. Um, he's a kind of a reasonable person. Um, makes it makes me feel the media are very culpable, right? In yes. in all of this, um, but but I, I just. I, it almost left me feeling kind of helpless because I felt I would have to explain to him a very large body of information, which maybe I should have started doing a long time ago, but I didn't. Um, and I suspect there's a lot of us out there who have this feeling, who have friends, family, who are in this boat where they're seeing you know, this, these alternate versions of reality and trying to deal with it. Yeah. Well, Trump enjoys 90% support among Republicans 
and probably 55, 45 at most times among independents. And that's not because people are infatuated with his looks or his persona necessarily. It's for two reasons. One, he's adopted most of the Republican traditional agenda. Conservative judges, skepticism about radical abortion on demand, secure borders, and uh, strong defense, low taxes. That's what Republicans are always for. The difference is he added a couple of little tweaks to it that got him nominated and elected. He also said that the industrialized center of the country was hollowed out. And that was because of globalization and Chinese nefarious commercialism and mercantilism. And that was a taboo subject among Republican investing class. They said creative destruction adjudicates where industry goes. For, you know, the opiate epidemic probably caused people to leave or whatever they thought. So he appealed to populists as well, but mostly it was in the confines of a Republican agenda. Had Trump come out for abortion on demand like the left, or had he shut down the Keystone Pipeline, or had he shut down Anwar, then he wouldn't have had 90%. So it wasn't a cult, it was an empirical decision why people who did not support him, and remember the majority of Republicans did not support him in the primaries. He was the largest vote getter, but he never got a 51% majority of all of the votes that were cast. So people came to Trump because of not his personality or his cult of personality, but because of his agenda. But there was another final uh, reason that people gravitated toward him. When they looked at John McCain in 2008 and Mitt Romney, they felt that they had played by what I had called in the Trump book, the Marcus of Queensbury rule. That there was a war room in the Obama campaign, or that Don, uh, Mitt Romney was rendered to be a hazer at 16, or a torture of animals when he put a cage on his car, or he was married to a woman who was a equestrian. He was guilty of all of these crimes against the working class or people of color. And he didn't fight back. He didn't say to Candy Crawley, you don't interrupt in the debate and join my opponent. That's, that's unethical. I'm not going to stand for it. He just, he took it in the second debate. John McCain said, we're not going to mention Reverend Wright. Why? Reverend Wright was an anti-Semite, a racist, the personal uh, pastor of Barack Obama, and Obama actually entitled his second book, The Audacity of Hope, after a phrase from Reverend Wright that it was his trademark. So the point I'm getting is Trump comes along and says, you know what, I'm not going to win uh, nobly, I'm going to win ugly. I'm not, I don't want to lose nobly anymore. And for a certain segment of the population, they said, you know what, we need a pit bull, cut the leash and turn him loose. And that, that has scared the left. And so they've decided now that he has a cult, but if that's a cult, I've never seen so many people criticize Trump uh, that vote for him. I pick up the paper every day and I hear people say, I like what he's doing, I just wish he wouldn't tweet. Or I like those rallies, I just wish they don't last 45 minutes and not an hour and a half. So I don't see any lockstep Trump society. Where I saw a cult was very scary was during the Obama administration. I saw people, uh, little girl, videos of little girls with scarves on singing Obama songs. Or I saw people calling uh, phones Obama phones that he'd given free people on public assistance. There was a cult. I saw a certain nomenclature that Obama used. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Or using Latin phrases, vero somos, yes we can, or Greek colonnades. Uh, it was really a cult, I thought, that Obama was some kind of savior. I think Evan Thomas phrased it best, he's now become some kind of god. I'm quoting directly. And so that was something that the left knows a great deal about, cult, but I haven't seen it with Trump. I've seen a person who said, you know what, I got to a certain point in my life where if I didn't fight back, the progressive project would sort of encompass my entire existence, whether it was the NFL with Colin Kaepernick, or whether it was Hollywood movies, or whether it was the Soros Foundations, or whether it was transgender restrooms, or whether it was uh, the media. I was surrounded by a particular worldview and nobody was pushing back and saying, 
late-term abortion is evil. The, we have a border. It's not racist to say we, sh we should have a defined space in the United States. And you know what? Uh, we need energy. And you know what? Global warming, if it does exist, we can deal with it in a graduated fashion. Nobody was saying that. And so they, it was an idea that people were angry and they had nowhere to turn to. So they, they said, you know what? I just want somebody to go out there and give us our point of view. And that's what Trump did. In a brilliant fashion, he was a diagnostician. He understood the symptoms. He came up with a diagnosis and he offered a remedy and prognosis. Well, so I think the question on a lot of people's minds that, you know, for example, watch this show or, you know, read your columns or so forth, but have, you know, friends and family out there who are religiously reading the Epic Times or, uh, you know, watching CNN or MSNBC or something and believe, you know, because why, why shouldn't they, maybe, you know, they, they hadn't really thought about it too much. How can they get through this idea that they're bigots and somehow intellectually or you know, have, have, have problems, serious problems, because they're, you know, subscribing to this. this. Yeah. At this late date, passive defense does not work. And by that I mean, if you sit there, and I have family that disagree with me myself. My siblings are Bernie and uh, Clinton supporters. But if you sit there and wait to all of these accusations to be made against you, and then you think that in sober and judicious terms, you're gonna refute them, it's not gonna work. So what you have to do is when somebody, you can, be, you can be reactive in the sense that you don't wanna go out and force altercations or, or unpleasant moments, but when somebody starts in on that, you, you don't wanna say, I'm not a racist. You wanna say, any time that you adjudicate what a person thinks, or you categorize a person by his color, or his religion, or her gender, that is racist and it's sexist. And we're not, I'm not gonna take it anymore. I don't want to suggest that if a person's dark or white, or Chinese, or Oxit, whatever term it is, I don't wanna live like that. And you do, and you're projecting your own racism upon me because you have a real problem and you can't be empirical. Or when somebody talks about, well, you want to build a wall, you're a nativist. You say to them, I don't have a wall around my house. You have a wall around your house. Barbara Streisand has a wall around his house. Mark Zuckerberg has a wall around his house. My children are in public schools. Where are Elizabeth Warren's children in? They're not in public schools. So this whole project, uh, progressive idea in some ways is a projection. I want to live around elite people, I want to make a lot of money, I want to live in a nice neighborhood, I want to have a lot of servants, and I feel real guilty. And so then I project racism, homophobic, nativism, protection, all of these isms on you. And uh, I'm not going to take it anymore. And so that, that's what I try to do. When people talk to me in this area, especially because we're in Silicon Valley, I always say to them, did you put your children in public schools? I put all three of mine in public schools. Do you live in a racially diverse neighborhood? 90% of my neighbors are Hispanic. Do you have a, uh, a sanctuary around you? Do you have private guards? Do you have bodyguards? I don't. Do you? Do you have a large bank account? Do you have all of these things that you suggest are toxic actually are a psychological mechanism uh, to protect one, and I'm not exaggerating. Just look at the, the field that are in the Democratic Party right now. Elizabeth Warren wrote a book about how to flip houses and profit. She put her kids in private school. She lives in one of the most Tony uh, neighborhoods in Boston, Cambridge. She's a multimillionaire, and she parlayed a fake ethnic identity in the most cynical fashion to take a spot from somebody else to become a Harvard law professor. Without that Native American identity, she wouldn't have been a Harvard professor. Bernie Sanders owns three homes. He's a multimillionaire. Joe Biden is a multimillionaire, very multimillionaire, big multimillionaire. Joe Biden is worried about sexism and racism. That's all he talks about. Joe Biden can't go into a public room without spotting a teenage girl and going near her and blowing and touching her in a way that anybody else would be chastised and, um, and called out for. 
Joe Biden says that Donald Trump and his supporters are racist. Joe Biden said, Barack Obama is very impressive because he's a clean black. He's articulate, as if blacks are not clean and they're not, they're not well spoken. He went into a donut shop and said, wow, you can't go anywhere without seeing a bunch of Indian Americans. He, he just gave a talk the other day and said, I was a, you know, 2017, I, he said, I used to be a, a, a swim, you know, I swam here and I was a lifeguard at this inner city pool and guess what? These inner city kids used to look at my legs and touch them and say, wow, they're blonde. I learned all about roaches, roaches. So what I'm getting at is a lot of these liberal people say things that are racist and sexist that all the people at the so-called deplorable and irredeemable people don't say. And they live with people of various backgrounds and they get along. And you have this elite class that is, lives in segregated circumstances they use language that anybody else would be called out for. And they have a medieval exemption, just like the church in about 1300 that said, you know what, if you give us money and you write, we'll give you a penance for things you've done or an exemption for things you will do. And that's what progressivism does. It says, join us and therefore you get out of, get out of jail card and you can say or do anything you want. And so the funny thing is, at brief moments in history, we see this. And where do you see it? You see it when you put everybody on the same stage, on the same page, progressives. And what are the first thing they're doing? <laughs> they're saying, Cory Booker is now saying, you guys are all racist because no black people are on the stage. And then what are the white people saying? They're saying, wait a minute. It was a free, it's a free poll and fundraising is free and if you really like Kamala Harris and Cory Booker, they should, black people and white people should, should vote for them and get higher in the polls. Our, our, our only crime is we're beating them and then we watching this said, no, 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 you're guilty under your own ideologies of disparate impact because according to your own philosophy, if the proportions of a particular profession are not reflective of the actual numbers in the population. And even if racism doesn't exist, it does exist. It's implicit. Therefore, there are six people on that stage, they're all white. Somebody is racist. Why do we know that? Because you told us that. And that's what happens in these revolutionary movements. Yesterday's revolutionary is today's counter-revolutionary and tomorrow's enemy of the people and they get into that Jacobin phase. And that's what happened to the Democratic Party. Now nobody can be pure enough. And what happened, they're all white, elite, wealthy people on this stage, and they stand convicted by the hypocrisies of their own ideologies that they impose on all the rest of us. And we get to watch it. It's theater to see this in action. So Victor, you've you know written, of course, in the case for Trump, which we talked about last time we spoke, um, that Trump is this tragic figure. Um, is, is he going to survive impeachment? Where are things gonna go from here? Sort of. And in the book I mentioned Sophoclean heroes like Oedipus or Ajax or Antigone and then how that theme was manifested in the John Ford Westerns, the Searchers or Magnificent Seven or Shane or High Noon or with American military figures like George Patton or Curtis LeMay. And, and the theme was that certain people come along to an ossified society that is in trouble. And they have certain uncouth skill sets that allow them to do things that bring results. But in the, the process of bringing results and bringing progress and security to the proverbial town, they also offend the people the more secure they get. And they think, why? wow, why did I ever bring in George Patton into the U.S. Army? Or wow, Curtis LeMay was Dr. Strangelove in 1958 or 62, but he wasn't in 1945 when the Japanese were threatening us. Or uh, I don't like Oedipus, he's kind of crazy, but wow, when we had a plague at Thebes, he had the answers. Uh, so what I'm getting at is that Trump is getting very successful. We have 3.5 unemployment as we speak. Stock market is at a record high. We have no wars abroad. And people are starting to say, wow, we've never had an economy like this. Real wages up 3% per year after stagnating for 10 years. 
and now we're having the luxury of thinking, but he's so crude. But look at him, he has this orange skin. Look at these rallies. Why does he have to have the rally? Look at that tweet the other day. He went after Kellyanne Conway's husband. That's so unpresidential. So what I'm getting at is I think he's going to be very successful. And I think he will be reelected. But is he going to get the type of praise that Barack Obama does for his mediocre record now? No, he's not. And that seems to be realized by Trump himself. So like all tragic heroes, he's angry that he doesn't get praise commiserate with his actual benefactions. And so I think he's going to proverbially ride off into the sunset. I think he'll be wounded in the election, but survive. He'll do a lot of good in the, in the next five years, but uh, he's not going to be considered by historians or the media as a positive character. And ultimately, he will be, I hope, like a tragic figure that we, uh, that we recognize what he did. And uh, it's central, I'll just finish by saying it's central to every tragic hero that they are petty. Uh, Oedipus was petty. Uh, the Magnificent Seven in that classic remake of Seven Samurai say, you know, we never win, we always lose. And it's sort of self-pitying, and uh, pity is a better word than petty. And I think by that I mean that Trump is always trying to tweet out, look what I did. Look at the unemployment, look at black unemployment, look at Hispanic, look, look, look. And you want to say to him, you're playing a role that you, you, there's no way out for you because you have certain skills and certain demeanor and certain manner of speech that offends people's sensibilities. And once you've done what they wanted to, solve the problem that they couldn't solve precisely because of their conventions and their respectability, you can't expect them to praise somebody that's antithetical to themselves. So you're in a paradox of your own making. And that's what's tragic about it because he, he's done a lot of good for the United States. The fact that he was elected meant that seven million people right now are working who otherwise would not be working. And I see them every day in the Central Valley of California. And there's, a, there's a, uh, an energy about them, people who are unemployed of all different races and backgrounds. And as one person said to me in Selma the other day, employers come to me, I don't go to employers. And that gives him a certain sense of respect. Victor Davis Hansen, such a pleasure to have you. Thank you.